always ask your why. I want to know your why, why you do what you do. So we'll definitely ask that. Hey, Mo. Hey, Ricky. The doctor is in. Yes, yes, we are. The doctors are in. And we're so yes. thrilled to right, to be back with uh, with BCA, Breast Cancer Action. And it's been a, a number of years. I don't think we thought we would be around this long on blackdoctor.org when we uh, did the show with them years ago. But I love the fact that someone really stands up to so much of the pinkwashing and so much of the, the soft promises that happen in this space and really holds people accountable. And, and I think when I think about BCA, that's what I think of. I yeah. think of folks who are really holding holding us accountable, whether it's research, whether it's advocacy, legislation, and um, and making sure that we're we're inclusive in this space. So I, I I'm just thrilled that that we have Dr. Kr here with us today. Uh, yeah. Is it okay to call you that, Doc? <laughs> yes, that sounds good to me. I might I might actually start going by that a little bit. <laughs> I think you should. Yeah. 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 That's so great. I know. We just I just remember that we had. We had, um, you know, them on the show. And I think that was like really early on during COVID in our early years, you know, and, um, but I think that what we love talking to people who make an impact and, you know, we have so many of us in this space and I think breast cancer has more advocacy groups than any other disease because we're women and we all take care of each other in some way, right? We have this love for each other. So, so, um, but, but I love it when people can say, this is what I did and this is what happened. And that's what you guys are doing and you're making such a difference. So, so talk about it. Tell us about it because I don't know if an, a, a lot of black women really know about you guys, yeah. you know what I mean? And so we need to get them knowledgeable. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you for inviting me into this space. Um, it's really good to be in community um, especially with folks who, who share parallel identities, um, you know, and, and as a grassroots, as the first kind of Black femme executive director of a historically and predominantly white organization, and although our work reaches and expands across all demographics and identities and such, but coming in as a leader in this space, um, and being very intentional about the intersections of our work um, is um, exciting. And also when you think about the breast cancer movement and you think about all the red tape and systemic inequities and oppressions and being um, who I am within my identities, being black, being queer, being a femme, um, being able to like be out loud about these things and carry on the history of our organization. We've always been loud. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've, uh, as you said, Ricky, we've been um, one of the organizations that just kind of calls it as we see it and calls out and calls in folks, right? Um, but that's in our very name. Uh, you know, we're very intentional about naming action in our words because for the folks who had founded our organization, uh, they came from a grassroots, I, I don't know if y'all remember ACT UP back in the 80s and into the 90s and such. And um, it, uh, so ACT UP and the culture. Oh, you remember? Okay, now. <laughs> no, no, tell everybody else because they don't know. So yeah, yeah, oh, keep going. It's a coalition. Oh, yeah. um, ACT UP, um, a group of, um, a coalition, but also a group of other partner organizations that were really um, doing grassroots level advocacy and organizing works specifically in the 80s and 90s around HIV and AIDS and such. But rooted from that was a lot of health equity work. Um, but back then equity wasn't being named. So, you know, um, more social human rights kind of work or whatnot, but we've actually, um, I think as a movement have been very intentional about naming equity and inequities and oppression now. But um, ACT UP and the folks that were leading that work did some really amazing grassroots level work. And a few folks uh, within that movement started Breast Cancer Action because one, the three folks that co-founded the organization all um, were navigating either a current diagnosis of breast cancer or have overcome, um, you know, treatment and um, their and the disease. Um, so their intentions were really rooted in the fact that uh, prevention wasn't being discussed. Um, it wasn't just enough to say, okay, someone has breast cancer now, what did we do? We were really looking at the root causes of breast cancer and really looking at systemic interventions and changes. Now, you know, um, back then it wasn't specifically named environmental racism, um, thinking about, you know, how those are at the core um, issues uh, with this disease. 
But we named a lot of like injustices. And I think now in the iteration of Breast Cancer Action, we're really focusing on those intersections of gender justice, racial justice, environmental justice, and climate justice, and how all of those encompass health justice together. Wow, well, well I love that. I know you're preaching, girl. I, I was just at, um, I was just in Davos at the World Economic Forum, and the intersection of all these things is becoming more and more clear, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like the breast cancer community historically had not been as inclusive. I think that, you know, and I'm, I'm a, a, a Black queer femme presenting breast surgeon in this space where there's very little representation, but my patients still don't have materials that look like them, that speak to them and their support groups. The, the pink washing that happens in this space, I feel like has overshadowed a lot of um, good opportunities for really leaning into that intersectionality and exploring that from a research standpoint, from a data collection standpoint, from an outcome standpoint. There's so much work we have to do in this space. How do you all decide what your agenda is and how do you strategically target what you hope to do? And um, I, I, yeah, where do you start? With, yeah, to, where do you focus, to, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Things. Yep. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, as y'all know, there's so much when it comes to not just the movement, the breast cancer advocacy movement, but the industry, right? Like, because there's money in breast cancer. And I, I think uh, that's where we start with tackling the industry. So we really think about not just the systemic interventions, thinking about policies and institutions and practices um, that don't center folks within the furthest proximities to power. And typically those identities of folks within the furthest proximity uh, um, to power are us. Black folks, queer folks, trans folks, you know, et cetera, right? Indigenous folks, BIPOC folks, all of that, right? And, and then there's, you know, overlapping margins there and such. So um, because we focus on those systemic interventions and we focus on centering those folks within the furthest proximities to power, then there is no running away from the identities we're talking about. Like we, um, I think that how we kind of prioritize our work outside of systemic interventions is really, again, looking at those root causes. I think one of the leading things we talk about um, both internally and externally as we do our work is how are we discussing prevention? You know, we can discuss treatment, we can discuss, you know, advocacy practices and things of that nature, but if we're really not talking about like really discussing how this disease even starts and how we tackle those things, then we're just putting a Band-Aid over the problem because our goal isn't to manage this thing, right? Our goal is to really tackle the root causes of this public health issue and this crisis. And unless you're like pulling the the, the plant from its roots, we're, we're really just, you know, flipping away, you know, and just preventing it from like getting bigger and bigger and such. So I think how we focus our priorities is really just looking back at the root. And, you know, Dr. K, I love how you're saying that. And if you think back into like the 80s and 90s and what what made breast cancer pink, it was probably Coleman. Oh, yeah. Because they were the only ones around. They had the pink ribbon, the, the ribbon, the pink, I think started probably with them. And and they were a bunch of Dallas housewives that had no connection to any other any other sort of genre of people than Dallas housewives, right? So I think that started. But but one of the things that we're looking with as you're looking at at um, kind of these systemic things about prevention and 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 I can tell you a story about that in a minute. But um, we're looking at the 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 drugs. We're looking at the science because right now we don't have science for our people. And if you think about it. How many queer black women or queer women or black women were in clinical trials 20 years yeah. ago when, when they were making adriamycin and taxotere and all these they're, drugs? They're not, they weren't even counting how many they queer women. Let's, counting. You know, that's, right. Yeah. So, so to me, like it's, you know, we, we can talk about prevention and we should, and it's a, it's a really important thing. My daughter's having a prophylactic mastectomy on Monday to, to, you know, fight my, what I brought to the table here and my family, but, um, but also we're dying, we're dying, and we're dying in ridiculous numbers because the drug, the science isn't working in our favor. And so I think, it, and that's also, that's systemic, that's policy, that's all these things that, that you're addressing, but it also goes to, okay, who's making these medicines and what, and who are the, you know, everybody needs to take accountability for these numbers that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. You're spitting, now listen, you're preaching now about <laughs> accountability of, and, what what 
I tend to lean on is um is the trust factor, right? Like when you when we have so many years of systemic racism um and navigating the nonprofit, well, not even nonprofit, but the medical industrial complex and the breast cancer medical industrial complex and all these different things, um, but specifically a system that wasn't created for us or treatments, uh treatment or research that we're very often not found in but, or created for but, us. Um, we, we, I think for, I won't say forget, I think that sometimes when new treatments are out or, um, medications are out, I think that our system says, just trust us. This is great for us. Right. When we, as a people in a community have not had a long history or a current reality of trust being rooted within those systems, right? Like we might trust our direct provider that we've been working with, but thinking about the trust of the fully system that is governed by a political system that's not rooted in accountability and trust um, and federal agencies that make decisions and hold patterns and, you know, um, uh, put up all this red tape in the release of medications that could be beneficial for us and the release of less harmful treatments and things of that nature. It, it bears the question of why should we trust you now when historically um, there has not been any accountability. We understand that most of the treatments that are out now is because there were gene cells that were stolen from black folks anyways, like, you know, and where we constantly be tested on in eugenics and, pop, you know, if we really want to talk about it, you know? So I think that um, the, the, the folks that make um, our, our legislative leaders, as well as um, folks that um, are in the healthcare system, I think we all have to do a better job of having transparent conversations of what trust and accountability um, should look like, especially when we are um, tugging or uh, tasseling with the history that we, you know, face. You know, and that's interesting. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was going to actually bring up a different point, but yes. I, I, I want to talk about this a little bit because when I, when yeah. I talk to medical students, so I, I teach health equity at Dartmouth, and when we talk to the students, I tell them, listen, you, you have to understand that when we put on this coat, we are part of a community that has been complicit in creating a culture of mistrust. And you cannot expect that just because you're Black and you put on this white coat, that patients are going to trust you, they can believe what you say, and they're going to now magically transform their lives and take care of all the, the things that you're telling them to do and the metformin you want them to take and et cetera. That trust has to be earned. And mm -hmm. in the cancer space, especially, it's really challenging because here you are now faced with a diagnosis. You may know somebody who had cancer. You might know somebody stage for stage, but your treatment now all of a sudden seems really aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. You got, let's say, TNBC. And now all of a sudden you need chemo. You're like, well, why didn't my cousin need chemotherapy? And I don't trust this. And I think you have the, the cure anyway. Y'all holding on to it, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and my answer to you, though, in that question you asked, why now? Why should we trust now? And the answer is because if we don't, we're never going to get to the point where we can not only recognize what disenfranchisement feels like, but begin to envision the type of healthcare and partnership we want. Like we know what it feels like. We know what mistrust looks like, but we don't talk as much about what that healthy relationship looks like and feels like. And we, we don't get to that point of creating it because we keep, we're still at the point of, I feel this thing. I feel this thorn. I feel this thorn. Yeah. And we can never imagine what it feels like to have the thorn out. And I want us to really yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, normal. Normal. the thorn becomes yeah. yeah, the thorn becomes get, normal. It you know? does, but it doesn't have to be. But it's up to us as clinicians. I think you're absolutely right, KR, that we gotta bridge that trust. And that means not just offering the clinical trial to say, check, well, I offered it and she refused. It's like, no, no, we got to go back and we need to circle back and talk to Ms. Jenkins again and find out, well, why did she refuse? Maybe she just couldn't hear it right now, but she just got her diagnosis. Maybe yeah. she's trying to figure out her childcare situation and go back and do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again until that trust becomes more more visceral, right? That's right. And I think, right. Ricky, that's the part that clinicians are missing because women say, well, I, I didn't get a role because they didn't ask me or they only asked me once. Yep. Right, yeah. right. And, and really, it's really a lack of knowledge. What well, our research is showing that that it's fear of the unknown. It's because yep. they don't understand. And when you break it down in words they can spell and explain the medicine, explain the treatment, explain the trial, sign me up. I want to do that. I want to live. But they don't know about it. And, it's, and if it's not being taught to them from, from a voice of trust, you know, that's why, you know, we talk from when we trial, because it's from a voice of trust, another blessy. And so if they're not getting it from us, then they're not getting it in a way that they can understand it and trust it. 
But when the they data bears do, that out. Yeah, and the data yeah. bears that out. But when they right. do, they're like, hey, I'm ready. Let's go. What do you got for me? Bring it. Even when we spend two more minutes in the room and, and talk yeah. to a person the way they can understand, the data shows that people are 23% more likely to consider aggressive therapies that could be life-saving for them. And so it, it just yeah. really... It's a small thing, but it's a really, really big thing, you know? Yeah, and, and what were you gonna, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was gonna say, even to that point, um, so outside of breast cancer, actually, I'm also an adjunct professor at Emory here in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, uh, for the, um, for MPH students. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the discussions we have as they're, you know, going into research, going into, um, doing community-based, um, you know, data collection and things of that nature and such is not showing up. And I think historically in both medicine and um, public health, we're taught as professionals, you go in as a professional, you know, you go in, you got all these damn letters behind your last name. So they should right. trust, you, you know, right. I'm a doctor such and such and you know, right. all the other acronyms. So trust is automatically guaranteed. And one of the things that we work really hard in dismantling with our students is like, trust one as you said trust is not guaranteed is not given is earned right and how you build trust is through relationship and something you said is like you go back you ask questions you ask okay so you said no is there something impeding your decision right. okay. yeah you yeah. work jobs you know child care is lacking you may be taking care of an elderly you know some someone um within your family and whatnot transportation might be an issue you know uh, so there's these other barriers that our communities have, um, you know, there's dis disproportionate barriers there to accessibility to treatment that sometimes it's kind of written off like, oh, okay, you said no, right? And then also, you know, um, a lot of providers may not even have access to those clinical trial resources, especially small town, you know, right. I'm yeah. from LA, but moving to Atlanta, I see this okay. huge proportionate barrier. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I know m many more resources that I was aware of in in Los Angeles that when moving here to Atlanta, folks just don't have, like there's, you know, the, that that level of inaccessibility is there. So I yeah. think that, you know, yes, trust and accountability is one thing. And also when you're speaking about providers, especially providers of color that have smaller practices and are nudged within these smaller communities and the access to barriers or the limited access to resources yeah. that they face too as well. Right, right. Do you work with Dr. Lauren McCullough? At Emory, do you know her? No, but their name I'm sounds gonna, very. I'm going to introduce you. So she, um, she's actually working on the American Cancer Society, um, the, Black Voices study. They're doing this study of 100,000 Black women over the next I don't know how many years. But um, and I'm working with her on on the project with Dr. Melissa. But um, she studies the social determinants of health. And um, her she has a study that she recently published that says that Black women who have good health insurance have a still have a 60% higher mortality rate than white women of breast cancer. Oh, yeah. Black women who live in a socioeconomic, high socioeconomic neighborhood still have 126% higher mortality rate than a white woman in the same neighborhood. But yeah. she has some really, really interesting data. She's doing great. So I'll, I'll introduce you to her. She's awesome. Um, but I think you would find a lot of similarities in, in the work that she's doing with you know, just kind of what's going on in the world that is affecting all of us and definitely affecting cancer, breast cancer. Absolutely. Thank you. Know? you. Yeah. Um, we saw that in the military, though, when you look at TRICARE and you pull the numbers yeah. and look at the, the 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 claims, the data. Oh, yeah. Women who are in the military who have access to screening every year, who, you know, have insurance, right? They have the, allegedly the best care. Uh, still have a higher mortality than their white counterparts, uh, despite their annual screenings, despite all these other things. And so there, there's definitely something more that goes beyond certainly social determinants of health um, that falls under the umbrella of bias and biology. And yeah. finally, right, finally, we're starting to recognize, you know, that there, there has to be something to the science, whether it's looking at uh, epigenetics and allostatic load and which is which is a huge area of interest right now you know what's happening to our genes as a result just of racism right our yeah. gene expression yeah. I was on a, oh, yeah. a panel on Saturday talking about that right and they're starting to tease these things out and really look at whether or not it's the cancer itself the response to treatment or if it's something that happens to the genes the protective genes as a result of the fatigue of just being black in America right right 
having just the stress that we are under every day as black women, yeah. right? Whatever. Now imagine looking at that, looking at black and queer, right? right? And okay. black and queer and impoverished or black and queer and in areas that are, you know, where, where food apartheid is a thing, right? Or where, yeah. where the air is not clean, right? Or where there's yeah. poor access to, uh, so, so yeah, it, this, there's a lot, I think, that we're starting to recognize and finally fund too. And that's a huge part of what BCA does. And, and you know, in terms of helping yeah. to advocate for legislation and, and to direct funding, I guess, is, is that... Uh, is it fair to say that's something that you you all really tried to um, put some some muscle behind and some support behind, like what should be funded? Yeah, um, that's a part of our work too. Uh, following the dollars, uh, you know, in Kona, a part of you know October, folks know it as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We call it Breast Cancer Industry Month. We've called it Breast Cancer Action Month um, because it's it's you know, corporate and the industry's way of like pouring in dollars, pouring in. And then also for these mega com corporations, they're like, we're going to do our part. We're going to, we're going to poison the world, but there's one. We're going to you something pink. Yeah. Right. We're going to boop. Here, here you go. We're going to, you know, dumping into these large mega nonprofits that, um, you know, have not, do not currently have any strategies around prevention. You know, and our um, uh, and and you know, we, we won't. Well, I could name some nonprofits, but we, we don't need to um uh, pay more attention to these mega groups because the true issue is that we're dying, right? Like we're 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 being we're dying. We're dying. at the end of the day, right? So yeah. a lot of the the advocacy we do and the discussions that we do have around action is where people put in their dollars, and that's why we have a conflict of interest policy as well as a um a uh. Um, forgetting the the word now, but um, uh, what is the term? Either way, we don't accept funds from any, um, you know, corporations or institutions or any industry that profits off of breast cancer. So, and that allows us to stay independent in our work as well as, um, and, and with our work, meaning we're able to call folks out or in. It doesn't, you know, give us some of those, um, barriers to like doing the true work we need to be done. And also, I mean, um, I think that it's counterintuitive being able to receive funds from an institution that pours into the very disease, right? So I think a lot of our work is being very intentional about, you know, where our standards are with, um, you know, our conflict of interest and such, but then also um, calling in foundations, calling in um, agencies and institutions to funnel their money to grassroots organizations that are really doing this work, that are working directly in communities, that are, you know, advocating for policies to um, increase access to more equitable forms of treatment and less harmful forms of treatment, that are advocating for uh, systemic change and um, policies around, uh, you know, environmental injustices and things of that nature, right? But um, I think um, I think that if we think about the larger funding world, um, with foundations and government systems kind of pouring into these large nonprofits, I think it's kind of like, well, we, we're doing our, our job, right? Like we're doing our job to really tackle this issue of breast cancer because we given 100.2 million to, you know, this, this institution here when smaller organizations, especially organizations that are centering those folks within the furthest proximities to power are not even getting a fraction of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it begs the question of like, what is the work? You know, what what is the work that is needed and who is um, not only profiting off of this, but who is holding um, kind of the 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 power here? Um, and um, so, yeah, to the short answer to your question, yes, um, those are some of the things that we do. Um, but at the, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, we know that our communities are bearing the disproportionate burden of this disease. So, um, our focus is on prevention. Got a tough question for you then, because the, the question becomes, wh what are the measurements and the metrics of success if the funding is based on impact, right? And now, and then don't get me started on the, the, the things we're measuring, like QR codes and other dumb things that don't really show impact for some of these uh, right. initiatives, but how, how do you then measure the success for uh, grassroots organizations and those who are doing this sort of systemic work when it's so deeply entrenched and there's so many layers of structural things to overcome? Like, what does that look like from a very um, real and practical standpoint? Yeah, um, so as long as people are being diagnosed and dying, we don't we don't count any form of like, you know, success, right? Like, because it could be anyone next, you know, like, um, 
it's just something that we're raffling with. But we do, you know, take a moment to um, reflect on progress, you know, and um, from those moments of progress, uh, we look at what policies are we, you know, working to be shifted, you know, um, how many folks are taking action, you know, um, just by like a simple email, emailing your legislator or clicking this thing or, you know, in, in our past as well as current, we've been able to shift legislation because of the power of people. And I think that for us, we understand um, that people power is is where it's at, you know, that um, I think sometimes, um, you know, just society, we look at our legislative leaders as the power officials and it's like, no, we put these people in these positions to act on behalf of their constituents. So if we are saying that these are the things we need to be seeing, that we need to galvanize our people power and um, build collective power to get these things moved. So we think about how are we building and shifting power as a way to shift legislation, change le legislation, um, shift systems, practices, and things of that nature um, as, as a form of a moment to reflect on the things that, um, you know, are going to be beneficial to um, addressing and ending this disease. Um, but in addition to kind of like just legislative shifts or systemic shifts or what have you, I think another form is um, the more people who we can um uh, help to become more informed about what's going on. Because I think by now, and we've said it, by now, everybody's aware of breast cancer. Like it's, we know, everyone knows it exists, right? Like breast cancer has touched someone in someone's family or friend circle, Absolutely. right? So the work isn't in awareness for us. The work is in the action behind the information. And a part of that action is political education, getting people informed about breast cancer, because we know one, for especially Black folks, the body has always been political, right? The body is a politic. But when you think about breast cancer, breast cancer has always been politicized too as well. So getting folks involved in the political education behind breast cancer and what that looks like and thinking about environmental injustices and things of that nature. So I think um, the, the, the elongated answer to your question is really looking at um, the ways in which power is being used to move action and move people has always been our gem for um, uh, addressing and um, ideally working to end this disease. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's, um, it's a lot. Well, first of all, I want to go back to what you said about October, because we're now entering February, and I feel the same way about Black History Month. <laughs> you know, that it's like when everybody else celebrates us and but we have it all year long. I mean, I'm blacked on March 1st, but I think October has just become a thing that just yeah. is just, you know, and so we kind of, you know, celebrate, celebrate it because it is a thing. But, but to your point about, about awareness, there was a study done by the ad council. This is probably like four or five years ago now um, that Coleman actually funded, I think, or partnered with them on. And it said that 98% of black women are aware of breast cancer. Okay, everybody gets it, right? 25% talk about it with their friends and family. 25%. Guess mm. how many act on it? 17. Mm. So, it. so that now this was a, a few years ago, but still we don't talk about it. We don't act on it. We don't embrace it. We don't prevent it if we can. We don't, because we don't know enough to be dangerous. You know, I mean, my daughter's getting a mastectomy, but that's because of the knowledge that I brought to her. Do you know what I mean? But but most families aren't talking about it at the kitchen table. And actually, Mo, remember when we went to Tulum? Mo and I went to Tulum a couple of years ago. And and um and you talk about but these women, um, were, we had about 40 women, 40. Yeah, it, it was their first, it was actually their first pride celebration in Tulum. Mm. And we went and talked about, well, I, I led uh, guided meditation and mindfulness. We talked about breast health. We talked about having conversations. And then also, you know, what do you do when, especially as a black queer person, you may not know your family history. You may not be connected. They didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah, they, they right. didn't know anything. They had, you know, a lot of them mm -hmm. had been to a gynae and some of them were 30, 40 years old, had never talked to their mom, had left home at 15, had never had conversations with their moms about breasts. And they were in the dark. They were in the dark and we were bringing them this knowledge, stuff that they had never heard heard before. And so we can't take for granted what people don't know. Yeah. Walking down the street, 
We gave a, a BEXA scan to this 65 year old woman at, at the Urban League convention last year. And um, she was dressed to the nines, the hat, the everything, the whole outfit, you know, Miss Houston walking down the street. She couldn't read the form, the permission form. Mm, bless it. Yeah. Never had a mammogram, 65. So you see people that you don't, you know, you can't assume anything about what people, who they are and what they know. And that's what we've learned with our, when we trial kit, we have to bring it down to who they are and where they are and meet them where they are and how they think and what words they use, the vocabularies they have, because that's only where you're going to get through. And we have to educate them because they're, they may be aware, but they, uh, what does awareness really mean? Mm. It's not action. What does that really mean? You know, the words you talk, mm. you know, but but if you're not talking about it and acting on it and knowing your her story and talking to your mamas and your grandmamas or whoever you need to be talking to about health, you're not going to get it. That's right. And it's, it's interesting. I hear somebody in the chat, Lillian says, because you don't know what you don't know. Right. Uh, and, right. And it's very true. Right. Um, exactly what it I, is. My, my question also is a little bit deeper than that. When you talk about you know, preventing and root causes. Now you're, 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 you're coming down my street here with the, with the farm and talking about, right, the things that prevent chronic illness also help to reduce the risk for cancer. How do you, how do we as a community democratize wellness so that um, everyone can benefit from the things that help to reduce the risk of cancer? Because even in the one in the screening, right, the language we use to talk about screening, the way in which screening is deployed is certainly um, suitable only for certain technologies. And there's a lot of room for disparity in that conversation. And but the then we age, talk about, the oh yeah, don't get me started age. on age, right? We'll have that conversation too. But the, just the actual risk reducing when, when food insecurity is real. Right. So you're eating what you can eat. You're not even focused on whether or not you're getting antioxidants and root vegetables and, you know, dark green leafy things for the selenium and the chromium. And like, how do you how do we begin to address that? And I guess the question really is this. What partnerships do you all form and how do you bring all the stakeholders around the table to start to to address some of these things from a really systemic standpoint? Yeah, because um, so beautiful question. Um, I think that a lot of organizations and coalitions within the breast cancer advocacy movement have their different focus areas, right? And for us, um, just in the roots of uh, when we were created and, and the work we do now, we've always made it a point not to focus on individual solutions, like on um, behavior change modifications and things of that nature, or even like what we consume. We know that, I mean, our, even the food in the U.S., it, unless you're growing it, it, it's not, it's, it, it's filled with all kinds of chemicals and, you know, hormones and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and it, I mean, and then we could talk about water supply and how uh, environmental uh, racism has affected that too, as well for groups of pe um, people are specifically BIPOC folks and indigenous folks, right? But um, that's not our jam, right? Um, we're very clear about um, our um, root causes that we focus on around prevention is all on systemic interventions. Um, really looking at addressing and any root, um, breast cancer through those interventions. So specifically eliminating environmental um, exposures and toxins, thinking about um, the fossil fuel industry, um, and uh, uh, when I say environmental racism, really thinking about, you know, for instance, um, in, uh, what are we calling it now? I think it's like the beauty, in beauty industry races or, or, you know, like kind of like those um, colonial mm -hmm. ideas of uh, standards of beauty and how right. um, environmental racism is engraved in that. Uh, what were you saying? I was just agreeing with you. I said, sure, sure. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's a whole conversation that we need to have, not only about the beauty industry, but mm -hmm. also about the support for innovation for, for new things that aren't carcinogenic, right? And you can tell everybody, oh, your hair relaxes or this and that, and oh, your, your products, just your, your dye. But when it's time to innovate and create things that work for us, where's the funding for those things? That's right. That's right. right. And I, I got a real problem with us proving that, you know, all the things we put in and on our skin are carcinogenic and we're not helping people find solutions. And That's I don't right. see that movement. I don't see oh, it happening yeah. at all. All right. We don't see that. We, uh, we're working on a, um, a study. We just started with um, a doc at Johns Hopkins and um, she actually wants to figure out how to solve the problem for young women, young black women. And so, so we're putting together this study that basically said, if you 
if you knew your risk because of the products you use. So if you're dyeing your hair, doing tattoos, permanent hair, whatever, drinking, whatever the things are that are risk factors for breast cancer, if you knew, or what would it take for you to change your behavior? Like, what do we have to say about those things? What do we have to make you understand about those things to say, no, I'm not going to drink anymore because I don't want to get breast cancer or I'm not going to dye my hair anymore. Because I, and, but it, it boils down to what is my solution? You know what I mean? Because if those are for, for black women, those are expression of self, mm -hmm. right? You, hair is the thing that's been our thing for whatever. What's the lady's name who made the first terms in the 1900s? <laughs> I, um, you know, oh, talking, we should tell her for Black History Month. You know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, what's her name? Anyway, but but like, Madam hair, Madam see, yeah, Walker. There you go. Madam Walker. Walker. We know she, she stole it from somebody else. Yeah, she stole it from the other. <laughs> that lady, I know. But think about that. But I mean, look at look at the hair industry of that has fed Black families for years black women entrepreneurs for years and so not only is it hair guy and hair perms it's like a family substance right it's um it's how we become independent so it's it's so big it's so much bigger than the the the, the cancerous hair dye thing you know what i mean i think so what are we doing about that what's going to replace the industry for for mamas who have put their kids through college on these products, right? And but your point, like, what are we, what can we do? Because it's not going to go away overnight, even though it's causing cancer. So what do you educate? So the study we're trying to say is like, what do we need? What, what do you need to know in order to change your behavior, your own behavior to prevent cancer? And then what alternatives do you have? And right? what, and what alternatives do you have? Yes, that's an area mm -hmm. of influence. You know, when we talk about what are we supporting, what what are our dollars right. supporting as far as right. innovation? That right. that's an area. Black chemists and black scientists who are developing right. products that are you know are are, are conscious of uh, the and, and reducing the risk. I'll say right like that 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 science needs to happen just as the science needs to happen surrounding you know the mechanisms of cancer or the mechanisms of drugs that we're trying to figure out so it's, it's a lot to um definitely uh untangle and 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 work on for sure and um i i have another question i'm gonna switch gears a little bit on this one because you know ricky i hear you and i'm gonna piggyback off something you say we talk a lot about what happened with AIDS in the 80s and 90s and yeah. 2000s yeah. and the, um, the the shift from stigma to action to solutions, right? To make this a chronic illness uh, in terms of HIV and AIDS. And I, I guess the question I'm asking is, are there parallels that you are seeing in the breast space? And if not, what are some of the parallels that we should be making? How can we make this this jump to actually get some get some shit done? in this space besides just throwing money at, you know, organizations that are performative and, and, and so forth. That's a big question. I know. Yeah, no. Well, and let me, let me give care some background too. So I believe um that um the age revolution really helped the whole clinical trial conversation in the gay community, because that's all they had. So if you wanted to live, you had to take an experimental drug right? Because you didn't have a choice. And so they were open to taking, you know, these drugs because they were going to die otherwise. And I, I wish that mindset were here with cancer, with breast cancer, because right now clinical trials are the best science we have for black women. And it is really a similar situation. They just don't understand it because they're not being educated about it. But in the early eighties, if you didn't take the clinical trial for AZT, you had months to live. And so I think it fostered the whole, you know, the the understanding of what a clinical trial was and how you could had to be open to it or you're going to die. There was nothing else. I think for for me, um, my my viewpoint is a bit different just because, um, you know, where we enter the conversation around like prevention and and, and such, right? Um, so I think I think uh, we're definitely in the same page when it comes to getting folks into clinical trials. And yes, back in the 80s and 90s, especially when HIV and AIDS was um, a, a very extreme, if not, you know, public health crisis pandemic, you know, like, I think that was, that was what we, I don't know if, if public health officially coined it a pandemic, but I know 
that, um, you know, it definitely mirrored a pandemic because it was um, definitely yeah. global, right? And so, um, so it was important to, you know, learn more, figure out what, what's the best course of treatment and getting folks within, the, in, within studies and trials so we can do that as researchers and scientists, right? And I think that a lot of, I think that public health and science was so far behind with um, thinking about prevention, thinking about how to keep folks safe, and et cetera, right? Because the ways in which you can track HIV and AIDS are different, right? So, and the a lot of the education and the targeting was on, on queer communities when we know that like HIV and AIDS does not discriminate against anyone, right? So I think that it was, it was very interesting back then, but because of a lot of the fear and, uh, you know, you, you're seeing people, um, you know, be unalived every single day, right? And um, and that fear marketing was the, uh, the, especially there for queer folks and trans folks and um, sex workers and et cetera, right? Um, uh, and folks that um, engage in survival sex. Um, I think that, that that pushed people into the, the trials, which I think um, when we're thinking largely of um, the results of that. I mean, folks have now have medications, right? We have more information, et cetera. So I definitely yeah. on the same page with that. When I think with breast cancer and kind of like this, this, uh, this understanding that we need more folks like us in trials, we need more folks like us to have access to um, these trials. So that way we can have more information and we show up more in the science and the data. And we have you know, unfortunately, the tangible proof, not just our story, because our stories are qualitative data, right? But, you know, when it comes to getting money and funding, they, folks aren't listening to our stories. So, you know, we need those clinical trials because we understand what's going on with our families. We can sit here all day and tell, name all the people we know in our families, how they got it, what they got. I grew up right. being told, oh, you're either going to die from, well, I grew up in the hood, so either from gang violence or from um, from cancer, some form of cancer, because it runs in our family. We always hear that, right? And I was always curious to know, like, what do you mean it runs in our family? Because it's not it's not asthma. Yeah. I have asthma that runs in our family, so I understand kind of the science behind that and how that runs in our family. But cancer is not that. So how does it run in our family? How like you know, um, not that it doesn't show up, but like, what is the root causes of how it's starting? And I think um, going back to the other thing we're just discussing about around like behavioral change, behavioral modifications and such, I think that's absolutely not the behavior part, but the things we consume, what we have access to needs to be an informed conversation for our folks, right? And then how we um, have access to better choices and things of the nature. That's one thing, right? But I, I truly, from this work, think that the conversation around root causes isn't had enough, you know, around environmental exposures, about the fact that people in um, New Orleans, um, there are communities and cities in New Orleans that are just wiped out in our cancer it's city. And in cancer, yep. Exactly. And we ain't focused on them because the people look, are Black, right? <laughs> They're Black, lower income, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it gets a little exposure and then not. Um, that Flint still doesn't have clean water, you know, like what, what, what we ain't talking about that and what, what this is going to look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. We have an area in DC that's cancer city, cancer alley. Okay. Oh they yeah. They used to mine uranium where I practice in Pennsylvania and Sellersville. They used to mine uranium in 1920. There's a lake called Lake Galena. It sounds lovely, but that means lead in lead. Lake Galena. Right? Right. right. Like, come on. Nobody's talking about those things nope. because they feel like they can't do anything about them. So how do they take that next step when they when they right. become aware? Right. How do you coach people or help them understand what's the next thing to do once you do become aware? Yeah, right. and then the thing is this, um, I think that's where the the action and the people power comes in. Cause I think that our history as black folks has always been rooted in organizing and mobilizing. Like that's how we, I won't say got free because we're still not free. We are still in this fight for freedom and justice, et cetera. But I think that's how we began to move policy and being more included into this, into policy and how we show up. Right. So I think that um, the, the vein of how we get things changed is through action is through um, yeah. political education and advocacy and organizing and how we move people um and uh and then also um I said this a little bit but you know our voices our stories um is qualitative data and I think that I think mm -hmm. Ricky you're saying that um uh, in this in the study um uh, the voices study um that your colleague is um overseeing or leading that you know 17 uh, percent of folks 
that, you know, have had cancer or whatnot, they barely talk about or something like that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. messing it up, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but the fact that, as you said, everyone is aware of cancer, but no one's talking about it. And we thrive off of storytelling. Like that is, th th those are our roots. Right, that is what we do. That is what we do. <laughs> that is what we do. I'm like, why are we talking about it? And, um, and, and of course we don't want to talk about, I mean, we could, as as uh, folks in, in in health, we understand like that we have some of the worst rates of every single epidemic, et cetera, or, or, or health outcome, like maternal and child health outcomes, maternal mortality, morbidity, and all these different things, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, all of, we can go down the line with them. But we don't talk about none of these things until it becomes a crisis to where now we're having to speak about it. And I just think that um, in order to begin to move and mobilize our communities, it has to start with those conversations that move into action, that move into change. Yeah, it does. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the, the movie Rustin yet. Have you seen it? Um, um, on Netflix, it's um, the movie about the, the man behind the, um, the, the march. Yeah, Bayard Rustin. Um, yes. Uh -huh. And um, it was produced by the Obamas. Mm -hmm. I you gotta watch it. Watch it tonight. You will be blown away. But it showed the power of mobilizing. It showed the power that that our people had in the '60s to do what they had to do, at, like by any means necessary. By you know, stand up all night and working like a do lock dogs, or having a day job and a night job to get shit done. And um, they all took it upon themselves with their own energy to do this work. And I think that is where our power is. And I don't know, I see it now, but I don't see it the way our forefathers saw it just a generation ago. You know what I mean? And um, it's, but the, the film will like really motivate you to say, okay, what can I do now? Let's fight, you know, bring it, you know, but I think all, the other thing, point I want to make about food too, Mo, is that, you know, if you're a single mom with three kids, McDonald's is pretty enticing. I mean, I haven't been to McDonald's in years, but I mean, you can buy a Happy Meal for how much money? Like you can feed your family for 20 bucks. They got a dollar menu. You kidding? Shoot. <laughs> right? They got, they got a dollar menu now. Right. So, you can, so you when you're driving like home, less than that. Yeah, you're driving home after you picked up the carpool and you went to the softball game and you went to the ballet class and and you still got to whatever. What are you going to do? And, mm -hmm. and, and you got $20. What are you going to do? And so that that whole food thing is just is becomes an economic conversation mm -hmm. and an environmental one when you look at the amount of microplastics that are in right. the food right feed, right it right. blows your mind and what the, yeah. the the consequence of that generations from now i think has yet to really be yeah. uh, quantified and and it's it's scary but you're right you know because these are the, the the issues that are facing folks in 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 real life you know like i think that many many people more than ever want to grow their own food right they recognize that food is medicine they don't quite know how but they recognize that it is and that it can be but then when you talk about who has access to these things and what that looks like and what can the average person do that allows them to feed their family of four reasonably you know, while their patio garden is growing, while their, you know, their windowsill garden is growing, right? You might get a couple string beans, but how do you really truly feed a family? And right. I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen on that front as well, because um, people just, they, they don't know. And, and um, they don't know, they don't know, yeah. they, don't, they don't know. But, you know, you bring up that movie and it's the, 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 the thing that I saw was the challenge of folks who have intersecting identities in participating in this justice work, right? Because, right. you know, when you're Black and you're queer and you have a strained relationship with the church, for example, how do you mobilize folks? How do you do some of the, the work of, of, of social justice and particularly of, of justice in breast health, right? Mm -hmm. When the relationship with your breast is so potentially complicated. Um, right. and, and, and I, I guess I also want to um, want to ask about sort of those partnerships with the queer community and the messaging that needs to happen. And how do we uh, how do we untangle this thing so that people feel included in the messaging about uh, risk reducing and, and about early detection and about breast cancer? I think um, a lot of it, and you said messaging, is our language, like shifting our language and being intentional. Like I think in a lot of spaces, we're always concentrating on cis women and, you know, oh, women and this and that and everything. But like all folks with breasts and chest tissue do not have the same identities. And um, until, oh. we, 
um, but let's talk about it, you know, and until and when we speak about, well, I'll take a step back to as well, because I'm, we're speaking about black, queer, and uh, uh, trans folks, right, and gender expansive folks. And I think sometimes when we're speaking about like black liberation and black health equity, we're talking about it in isolation of like queer and trans liberation and equity when we're talking about black folks. Like, no, like we cannot get to um, queer and trans liberation, or excuse me, we can't even get to black liberation until we get to queer and trans liberation. So let's talk about all these things together. And I think that because within community, we're still not at a place. And when I'm saying, saying community, collective black community, we are not at a place where we understand that those things cannot exist without each other. And, um, and especially when we're talking about how do we get to equity and freedom and health and, and all of that, right? Health justice. Like if we're mm -hmm. still not on the same page here, um, then and understanding like the disproportionate rates of all these un inequitable health outcomes and all that kind of stuff are more extreme in those um, parallel identities, then we're how can we have collective conversation about how we move our people and et cetera, because we're still not even here. So that's one thing, right? But in order to shift language and, and shift how we speak about not just breast cancer, but like our health in general and stuff, we have to make sure we're not essentially erasing folks from the conversation because of the language we decide to to okay. use. Okay. And um, it's not a conversation. And I, you know, I'm I'm a cis person. Like, it's not a conversation about like I'm I'm not included. No, it's the fact that if we're not centering the folks within the furthest proximities to power. Yes, I face barriers and parallel identities, but I also know I have privileges. I'm light skin. I'm slim. You know, I have letters behind my name. All those other kind of stuff. I'm um, I'm cis het assumed. You know, all these different things and whatnot. So how am I using my privilege in these ways to decenter myself and center folks that fall deeper within those margins? And I think until we can have those conversations and really start using words that in are, I hate saying like inclusive, inclusive, but like don't erase folks or whatnot, then it's very difficult to come up with a strategy or um, collectively come up with a strategy across movements, across across like queer movements and, you know, a set of folks um, in the work when we're erasing people by just our words, you know, and, and it can be more harmful than not. And I think that sometimes, especially in this social justice space, we think that by using pronouns, we've done the work. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. because I asked your pronoun and we're I'm not misgendering you doesn't mean we did some work here. That just that's just a part of who I'm how I'm presenting. But now, you know, as you said, we're barely starting to open up, you know, textbooks and medical books that we can see our skin tone in it, you know, or you know, or or see us right. a little bit. What would it look like to open up those books and also see our other identities, you know? So it's, it's hard to say, but I think that one of the ways in which we can work more collectively and intentionally together is by how we are um, discussing and having conversations around this very disease. So yesterday I had to present to a bunch of um, clinical trial PIs for a Pfizer project that we're working on. So I, I think we had about um, 40 docs on the phone that were doing clinical trials across the country. And so I started thinking about, um, you know, they all have good intentions, but the word I presented to them was being culturally agile. We need mm -hmm. cultural agility. So I wrote this definition, but it's basically building healthy, viable, productive, res and respectful relationships with patients, meeting them where they are. If you want to have good outcomes, you have to embrace their racial, their cultural, their gender, their age differences with understanding, compassion, and empathy and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I find it. And so I said, take yourself and put yourself in an environment that you've never been in before and see how you feel. And, right. and we do that exercise. We call it the only one. I, t I tell them to go sit, go, go to a black Baptist church. I invite my Asian students, right? To go yeah. sit, right? Go, go take a Sunday. Make sure you eat something first because you might be a while. But right. go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right. You can tell a sister to go to super cuts or tell, tell okay. a black man to go to super cuts and see what right. happens. Right. right. And, uh, and or go to a barbershop in a community. How many of those researchers were black though, Ricky? How many of those PIs? I didn't see any more. So, so where's the intentional effort to reach out, right? To those community oncologists. Yeah. So, right? yeah, we're, yeah. We're Val and I started with, do, do you have a black nurse in your office? That's where we started. Mm. Mm. Show me who you got in your office. So when when our patients walks in there, what are they seeing? 
you know, and um, and so we actually had an in incident with our one of our other projects, our clinical trial projects. We're doing these trial pro projects where we're basically helping them recruit for trials. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in one of them, uh, last night we were sending an email out, and so one of the locations in Memphis had us had a had a, a patient in the trial who would who didn't want to do our Nash Navigator program, and we said why, and it was because it was being offered to her by a white person. So when we talk to her, it's a whole different conversation. But if you walk in into this office where white people say, we're going to give you navig nurse navigation, it's free, whatever, all the good things we're saying, but because it was offered to her by the white nurse, she didn't, she didn't want it. She didn't get it. Like, what's in it for me? I don't, you know, I don't see black people here. And so we're now learning that we have to be the one to make the offer because when that offer, even for good stuff, we're offering them Unite for her, Mo. We're offering you know, $2,000 worth of non-medical services for free mm -hmm. and, and nurse navigation for free, being a, having a fairy godmother help you through the trial. But when it's offered by the white doc or the white nurse, they don't want it. Right. Because they don't see it. And that goes by, I mean, as we said, representation matters, trust matters. And, you know, I, I also, which is a thousand billion percent valid right and right. and also i think some of the conversations that um i have with providers or with even my students is that don't get it wrong we're all socialized into white supremacy like we we were born in this one in the u.s if you're in a part of this you know as i said the medical industrial complex or you know and all of that like there are things there are um biases and or biases stereotypes what what have you that we just pick up even with our own identities, right? So how, and I say that to say, even our providers who are black, brown, indigenous, et cetera, can also be socialized within these systems too, as well to perpetuate harm and things of that nature. So some of the conversations I have is that right. just because you think you're looking in a mirror, what is it? All, all, all skin folk and kinfolk. All skin folk. And, I was just getting ready to say it. All like, skin folk and know, kinfolk. Let me tell you, because you will get some bad treatment from some bad doctors, no matter what they look yes, like. It's true. Yes, I, I am a living testimony to that on a many different fronts. Mm -hmm. My experiences, right? And um, so I think I think that um, all of these things are valid, right? Like trust. Um, especially um, when it comes to the folks that, you know, typically aren't BIPOC folks, um, um, Black, Indigenous people, colorful folks who are listening that might not be familiar with the term, but um, they may not, you know, you might go into um, your provider and they don't look like you, but I think that some of the things that we try to advocate for, or just could have conversations about, is just like, asking questions, you know, advocating for yourself in those moments or bringing a patient advocate with you, you know, yeah. so you want to ask those questions because, you, you know, just by having some of those conversations and building that relationship and building trust, that might be what is needed to get you to the place you need to be in order to get access to the right forms of treatment and not to just write off folks because of identities, but just the question. I mean, I'm not saying trust. I'm saying have conversation and advocate for um, ourselves. It's true because when you talk about representation mattering, when you are, you know, when your identities intersect so much as many of us do, it's hard to find the level of representation that might make you feel comfortable. And I think it's something that we have to, to grapple with and be prepared for. But the number one piece of advice that I give, and I actually just recorded a webinar earlier today, is bring someone with you. Yeah. Right. And have an advocate with you, have them on, on FaceTime. Yeah. And COVID helped us out right. a lot with this. Oh, yeah. Because you can Zoom somebody, you can FaceTime them. And the right. first right. question I ask is who's important to you? Who matters to you? Who should be a part of this conversation? Yeah. Right. If this is just me and you, is there anybody else that, that you want as a part of this? Right. And if you don't have anybody else, but you want somebody else, let me go get my nurse. Let's go get the navigator so she can be your person. And she's going to sit there next to you and she's going to take some notes and ask some questions and be your your person and your advocate because that yeah. it creates a space really for trust for a longer conversation for interaction right it's no longer prescriptive where the doctor comes in and says you're going to do da 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 and has his hand on the door it's it's now there's another person saying hang on a second did i hear you say 
right? And they're writing right. these things down. Right. And it's, it's such an important part. But, you know, Ricky, I, I really, I love that you all are offering that. And you're you're right, you know, Unite for Her is a great program. I think that they have, um, over the course of their uh, evolution, they've really pivoted and, and evolved, I, I'll say, in, in their marketing, in, in the materials that are so much more diverse. I think there's still room uh, to be a bit more gender expansive. Yeah, it's yeah. not exclusive, but to be inclusive yeah. uh, and, and to make sure that the people that they want to help and serve and, and represent and support are represented on the site. And, and that, you know, even for touch, even for, you know, Komen, even for all, all of these yeah. things, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, how do we support people, you look, right? You look to see, especially when you're, when you're queer, especially if you are queer and, and not them presenting, you're looking right. to see who looks like me and, and do, is this a safe space for me? Right. Am I and represented here? Work. Am yeah, I'm we have to work to do there. Am I respected here? Wow, mm -hmm. our time is up. How is that possible? I'm like already. I was just kidding. Yeah, no, Dr. K, yeah, we're so happy you're here with us. You got. We got to do this again. We got to do this again. Please, thank you so much for allowing me to be in conversation with the both of you. This felt good, and uh, where it makes sense, please invite me back on. I'd love to be in another conversation with you all. I know we need to do a project together. Okay, so let's let's figure that out. We need to do a project together, and like, because I feel like we're not doing a good job, you know, with with queer women and, and, you know, the community, we need to do more. So let's think of something we can do and maybe not during pride month. Hello. You know, right. <laughs> you go, right? Just that one month. That's it. That's all. Know, we that's got it. February. We got June. We got October. It's ridiculous. That's it. But, Once you but, miss it, you just, I know you're, so, <laughs> no, let's, let's think about something we can do together. We'll follow up. Um, um, I, we're, and we need to, you know, we need to so, figure out how to do more educating in words that people can spell where they feel comfortable and safe and and respected so and if you got nothing from this conversation which i know you got a lot a lot from because it was very rich but you know one of the things that that dr Kara said was that you know none of us are free until all of us are free right and and so as you think about that in your advocacy work, because I know a lot of advocates are watching and they're from Tiger Lily, they're from Touch, they're from all the different spaces and places. Think about that in your advocacy work, in in, in the policy that you're supporting, and when you go to Capitol Hill and you're on the Hill, and when you are doing your marketing, your social media, your conversations, you know, uh, and um, closing with with Audrey Lord, right? There's no such thing as single issue struggles because we don't we don't live single issue lives. So we are all connected in this and we are grateful to Breast Cancer Action for coming yeah. and bringing that yeah. action, for telling yeah. these stories, for right, for showing us that there's a way to, to deeply entrench in this work and make it meaningful, make it count for all communities. So Doc, thank you, thank you, thank you. We so appreciate much. you. Yep, yep. Thank you know, my dad used to say, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So I love it when we see people taking a stand and being strong about it and, you know, standing your ground and saying, no, this is not mm -hmm. happening, you know, and we so appreciate you. So, yes, indeed. So, awesome. That's yes, it. Well, we hope it's been relatable, reliable, and real. It's what we do every Wednesday night here on blackdoctor.org. We are so thankful for the platform. So and for the sponsors. I know I was and with Reggie last week. Thank you, Reggie, for everything cool. you do for us. We're so Thank grateful you. to you. And, and our new word, blessed love, blessed love. <laughs> well, there it is. Bless you. Love. See you next week. Thank you so much, Dr. K. Love you, Mo. Bye, y'all. Love you too.